Welcome to the Rock of Grace podcast, where we are leading people to follow Jesus together. You can find us online at rockofgrace.org, and we're also available on Apple TV and Roku TV. We pray that God speaks to your heart today. And so God has a word for us today. Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 6. Three, and we're going to put that slide up again. As you're turning there, I want to set up the scene for you. Isaiah was having an encounter with the Lord. And in this encounter, he saw the entire earth is full of the glory of God. Now, many of us can look back to an encounter with God that changed our lives forever. For most of us, that's why you're here. You can think back to a moment when either someone led you to Christ in their home or maybe at an altar, you cried tears of repentance and, and God encountered your life. This was undoubtedly a moment where Isaiah encountered God. And in this encounter, he outlines in Isaiah chapter 6, we have the most notable line being verse 3, where he says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. So he, he says the very things that the angels are saying round the throne day and night. In fact, can everybody say, holy, holy, holy? Holy, holy, holy. I hope you don't get tired of that because you're going to be saying that for quite some time. God is so worthy of this glory, and so he's so different. He's so special. He's so set apart. He is holy. So Isaiah is, is getting a picture of who he is, and he says, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, now catch this, the whole earth is full of his glory. Now, if we could emphasize different words, right? We could emphasize the word full, or we could emphasize the word glory, but what, the words I want you to see today is the whole earth. The whole earth. Everybody just say the whole earth. the whole earth. See, we may have a hard time seeing that the whole earth is full of his glory because we all have routines. We all have a million things to do, and some of us do the, maybe do the same things every day. So the more routine our days become, the harder it is to see God's glory fills it. I make four peanut butter and jelly sandwiches every day the same way. Can all the parents say amen? <laughs> I fill four princess cups every day. I cut four, two apples, right, into sections and put them in bags every single day. So maybe you pack the lunches or maybe you go to work and you sit in the same cubicle every day. Maybe you watch The Price is Right every day when you get home. Although we're in the, series, the, the time of Netflix and Hulu, so maybe not. But the point is, I don't know your routine, but how many of you have routines and there's things you do every day? How many of you would say you eat bread once a week? Maybe even, yeah, maybe even daily, right? What could be more mundane or routine than bread, yet why does Jesus choose to use it so often and call himself the bread of life? Let's talk about that. The truth is we bump up against the wonder and the mystery of God all the time. I'm going to say that again. We bump up against the wonder and the mystery of God all the time. God's glory is right there in the midst of your routine. And when you realize that your imagination is awakened, the imagination that the Holy Spirit gave you, The heavens are opened, and you suddenly see that the whole earth is, in fact, full of his glory. It's not just the sun signaling a start of a new day. It's the witness of God's steadfast love that will always break darkness. It's not just dinner with friends. It's the laughter reminding us you're not alone. It's not just the sound of a baby crying at night, robbing us of sleep. It's the evidence that that child is loved and he or she believes you will care for her. These are all gifts that are ordinary, but they're extraordinary because they're filled with the glory of God. 
the mundane and the routine in your life has the capacity to reveal the miraculous when you realize the whole earth is full of his glory. So let me ask again, how many of you have some mundane, routine things in your life? Just for kicks, nod your head with me if you work in the same location every day, Monday through Friday. Just nod your head. About 80% of you, right? Do you realize that when you sit down to have dinner with your family and break bread with them, the Lord is there? Do you realize when you kiss your children goodnight and cuddle them, and pray for them, the glory of the Lord fills the space. Do you realize that when you enter your home and feel that sense of rest and belonging and safety, it's another sign of God's goodness and his glory filling the earth? Do you realize when you make a cup of coffee, come on somebody, in the morning and just mix in just the right amount of Dunkin' Donuts creamer, You know what I'm saying? Not Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Listen, we don't believe in heresy around here. Starbucks coffee, Dunkin' Donuts creamer. There's nothing like it. Oh, so good. Even the babies are saying amen. Do you realize that when you walk into your backyard, don't miss this. Do you know that your backyard is part of the whole earth? When you walk into your backyard to play with your kids, it's full of the glory of God. When you walk into the backyard and it's snowy and it's icy and your kids are begging you to play in the snow, but your back is hurting and you still choose to show love because you're a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who you are. I had to do that. Do you like that? I was on the fly. I just want you to know that was not in my notes. Um, that's, that's the goodness of God. The glory of God is in that. Some of you don't believe me yet. Some of you are with me. Do you realize, men, that when you serve your wife the way Christ served and gave himself for the church, the glory of God is in that? When you grab the broom and you sweep the floor just to bless her, the glory of God is there. Men, when you work all day and you persevere and maybe you deal with some, a client that's difficult or a boss that's difficult, but you stay committed and you stay faithful and you provide for your family and you put bread on the, on the table for your family, the glory of God is in that. Come on, ladies, pat your hus- husband on the, on the back. Well, we got one. <laughs> Apparently, I need to do a marriage seminar. Every other lady's like, I ain't doing it. (laughs) Women, do you realize that when you're working, be it as a nurse or a clerk or in the office, whatever it is that you are doing, that you are filling the earth with the glory of God as you do it under the Lord? Women who stay at home and raise your children, do you realize that the whole earth includes the living room you just cleaned for the third time? Can I get an amen? Amen. Do you realize the whole earth includes the kitchen where you just included your children in the baking process and, and they, let, they helped mommy? You realize that the glory of God is in that? It is, whether you realize it or not. All the common little moments are going to represent bread today, bread just like this. And If we're careful, we can miss it. In fact, communion, right, is this beautiful picture of the body of Christ coming together to break bread. And we're going to do that as our response to the sermon today. And the bread represents not just Jesus, but his presence among us. Remember what he said, wherever two or three of you just gather in my name, I am there. That's why it's so powerful to plant a church because you're planting two or three. You're planting Jesus, a representation of Jesus where people find Jesus. So who comes to the table of the Lord? Let's shorten that. Who comes to the table? Family. 
At the table of the Lord, bread is shared among family. Communion is often called the Lord's table, the table of the Lord. See, at the table, when we eat, just like the Lord's table, every story matters. Every background is valued. Every family member matters. It's amazing to me how many Christians want to eat at the table of the Lord, but not eat beside people of a different race or a different financial status. I got to tell you again, I know I said a few months ago, but I just want to say it again. There is zero place for racism in the heart of a Christian because at the table of the Lord, you're all family. You can't have a feast without the family. And when you value the bread and when you value Jesus, you suddenly look around and you value everyone at the table. Remember that time when Jesus fed 5,000 men plus women and children? Let's read that. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew 14. Matthew 14, I want to set this up for you. Keep in mind that on the heels of this, uh, his predecessor, his cousin, John the Baptist, was just killed. So you can imagine the grief in his heart. Jesus is actually going to escape. He's trying to escape the crowds, but they follow him. All right, so can you picture that? He's already healed people. He's already done miracles. So as you can imagine, the crowds are are following him, and look what happens. Let's pick up in verse 13. When Jesus heard this, that his cousin had had been killed, he withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by himself. But the crowds heard it. They followed him on foot to the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Can we stop? Do you know Jesus was in the midst of grief, and he had compassion for their grief? Isn't that shocking? When it was evening, the disciples came to him. So it had been a few hours now, right? Because when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place. The day's almost over. In other words, the, the sun's starting to set. Hey, Jesus, you know, let's hurry things around, along here. Send the crowds away to go in town and, into town and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. You've heard me preach on this twice here. You feed them, right? They said, why? We, all, we only have five loaves here and two fish. And he said, bring it to me. I love this story. Can you picture this? 5,000 men, men, so then women and children. So you're looking at 15,000 plus people. Some theologians believe maybe even 25, 30,000 people. Stadium. Picture stadium. Picture OSU stadium. Picture all of them standing there. And everybody says, we're hungry. And they're like, here you go. (sighs) But he says, bring me what you have. He ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and he said a blessing. So he thanked God. He broke the the loaves and gave them to the disciples. Then the disciples gave him to the crowds, and they all ate and were satisfied. They then took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces left over. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So Jesus took what little was given to him, and he multiplied it. A couple things I don't want you to miss here. He knew what they needed. He had compassion on them for their sick bodies, and he even knew they were hungry, right? And Jesus includes the disciples in the miracle, which, again, I think is stunning. I know you've heard preach on that a couple times. He says, you feed them. And then even after, by the way, even after their lack of faith, they're like, well, what are you, what are you talking about? Us feed them. He multiplies it, but he still delegates to his disciples and the disciples. But don't you love God keeps giving you second chances, like we said A little bit ago, 17 chances. But I love that Jesus, you know, he broke the bread. And he tore it off and he handed it. Isn't that amazing? 
For it to be shared, it had to be broken. He took what was little, the little that was given to him, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it away. And a lot of us, I think we like to hide like people in the crowd did that day and blend in. No doubt some of you try to blend in on Sunday mornings and hide, but I can see you in the back row, Todd. I can see you. Just kidding. God always sees you. God always sees right through the crowd, and he knows who's in the crowd, and he knows your story. He knows your fears. He knows your worries. He knew every pastor, man. He knew every single person in the crowd that day, every single one, every single fear that kept them up at night. He knows, he knows it. He knows yours. He knows the questions that you have about God. He knows the questions that you wrestle with. He knows the insecurities you have. He, he might know the anger that you have felt towards him in the past or maybe even now about unanswered prayers. He knows that. He knows that, and he cares. He knows your name. Let's back up about a 1,000 years, and we're going to look at the time of Abraham. Turn in your Bibles to Genesis 16. This is all in the mobile app, the Rock of Grace mobile app, if you're using that today. Genesis 16. As you're turning there, I want to let you know, kind of set up the scene. God had given the promise. This is kind of the beginning of our faith. God had given this promise to Abraham. He said, hey, I'm going to separate you. I'm going to make you the father of many nations. Your kids are going to be so numerous. Your offspring is going to be so numerous, like the sand and the seashore, like the stars in the sky. But Abraham is old. His wife passed the years of childbearing. And here, God gives him this promise that he was going to be the father of many nations, a very people unto God. And Abraham tries to speed up the process And Sarah tries to speed up the process by saying, here, you can sleep with uh, the servant, the servant girl named Hagar. Everybody say Hagar. First of all, God knows your name. He didn't have to include her name. She's Egyptian. She's got three strikes against her. She's Egyptian. She's a woman, and she's a slave. In that culture, that's three strikes against her. How many realize that? But God knew her name. There's no logical reason for God to not only know her name, but to call her by name and then give her the promise he gave her. But God is rich in love and mercy. He knows your name. He knew her name. She was the slave of Abraham and Sarah. They were given this promise by God that they would have children. And it was another 14 years when Isaac would be born. 14 years. So there's another sermon, uh, another day for trying to rush the promises of God. We won't go there right now. But the point is this. God somehow took this mess that they made and still made it beautiful. I don't know how he does it, but he does. So God once again used our failure to prove his love. What do I mean? Look at this. Hagar was feeling the anger and resentment coming from Sarah. It's right there in Scripture. Read Genesis 16. As you can imagine, because Hagar can give her husband what she cannot give, a child. Nonetheless, sleeping with her husband. So as she began to show, like what happens with pregnancy, four or five months in, she's showing, and now she's getting more and more of the hairy eye from Sarah. Anybody ever got the hairy eye? Looks like that, apparently. Okay? And she's throwing all kinds of shade at Hagar. She starts to fear for her life. Hagar runs into the wilderness. She feels like risking her life is better than staying under the anger of Sarah. Can you picture it? And there, God finds her. Again, Did you know God knows your name? 
You can't escape him. The whole earth is full of his glory. You can't run from him. You can try, but wherever you run, he is there waiting to love you. Look what God speaks. Pick it up in verse 8 of Genesis 16. Hagar, servant of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? Sounds like what he asked Abraham, doesn't it? Or uh, Adam, hey, where are you? Hey, what are you doing? She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress, submit to her. The angel of the Lord said, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for a multitude. Wait a minute. Hold on. That promise sounds familiar. Whose promise is that? Abraham's. Wait, wait, wait. She, wait. God passed on the blessing to an Egyptian slave girl? Yes. Who, th- who thinks that's amazing? Behold, you are pregnant. You shall bear a son. You shall name him Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. Although he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. We can even see that to this day. He shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. But she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, El Roy. So she named God. God named her. And then she named God. You are a God who sees me. She said, truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, the Lord is called Berlin Roy. It lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abraham a son, and Abram called the name of his son whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. And it was 14 years later, guys, when Sarah became pregnant and would fulfill the promise with Isaac. Did you know that God sees you? Ma'am or sir, if you're trying to run from God, you might as well quit. It doesn't work. God sees you, and God loves you, and he knows your name, and he wants to bless you. That's a great spot for an amen. Again, did anyone else see that God repeated the promise given to Abraham, right? Amazing. Let's fast forward now back to Jesus' time on the earth. You may feel no more special than a loaf of bread. But Jesus says something interesting about bread. Look what he says in John 6, verse 28. They said, what what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered him, this is the work of God that you believe. I love that. We preach this a lot here. What's the, what's the list? Is there like a long list? Is there an email you can send me of all the hoops I need to jump through? Nope. Just believe. Don't make it so easy, Pastor Jordan. Well, then don't make it so easy, Bible. Just believe in the one that was sent. So they said, well, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. See what they're saying? Our fathers, you know, we, we had man, we had bread fall from the sky. And listen to this. He gave them bread from heaven to eat, and Jesus said, Truly, it was not Moses who gave you bread from heaven. It was my Father who gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven, he's speaking of himself, and gives life to the world. They said, Sir, give us this bread. Can you imagine the frustration of Jesus? He's standing right there. I mean, imagine he's standing there and Josh is them, and he's like, you know, the one standing here. And they're like, well, introduce us to him, will you? Right? I mean, seriously. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and don't believe. 
All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In other words, the will of the Father. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but will raise it up on the last day. We talked about that the last few weeks in our King Jesus series. How many is going to be raised up on the last day? Thank you, four of you. I'll have to do the series again. How many are going to be raised up on the last day? Okay. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks upon the Son believes in him. There's that word again. Everybody say believes. Believes Believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus makes it clear that in the same way the Father gave bread to to their ancestors in the wilderness, manna falling from heaven to sustain them and nourish them, is the same way that God had now sent Jesus, the bread of heaven, down to nourish and sustain them. Can you see it? This is why I often tell life group leaders, don't skip the meal. The meal's important. When you break bread together, you're sharing life together. This is why Jesus was always at a party. If he wasn't at a party or hosting a party, he was inviting himself to a party. Zacchaeus, you having a party? Great, because I'm coming. All the time. Why? He wanted to be in the midst because at the table, when bread is shared, life is shared. Stories are shared. Jesus shared his life by sharing bread with them. Do you know that bread is the common denominator in every meal, in every culture worldwide? It's prepared differently in Italy. It may be linguine in India, right? We might, what we would call pita. In America, it's a loaf of bread, right, and butter. It may look like this. Or if you live in my family, it's called Papa John's. Can I get a witness? (laughs) No (laughs) matter. No matter where you live on this beautiful planet, you eat together and you likely share bread. And some of you are like, well, I'm on the Atkins diet. Don't ruin my sermon. The point is you share bread. And it's spiritual. Don't separate the sacred and the spiritual. This last week, I was sick. I mean, I was really sick. Wednesday, it wasn't just the aches. It was also the sinus migraine. And Danielle brought me a bowl of soup. Everybody say, oh. So I have a question for you. What's more spiritual, Danielle's action to bring me a bowl of soup or for me to preach this sermon? It's a trick question. Neither one is more spiritual. You guys are all like, I know the answer. I know, I know. No, it's me. No, I'm kidding. The point is, neither one's more spiritual. God is in it all. He's in it all. The whole earth is full of his glory. Every time you see bread, it should remind you that the bread of life has sustained you and nourished you and came down from heaven to save you. Every time. Many theologians believe it was during the Industrial Revolution that we started to really separate secular and sacred, spiritual and unspiritual. We like to think of church on Sundays, and I work 9 to 5. This is the real life, Monday through Friday. God is on Sundays. Real life happens during the week. No, did you know God wants you to turn every place into a sanctuary? Let me say that again. God wants you to turn every place into into a sanctuary because the whole earth is a sanctuary because the whole earth is full of the glory of God. How do I know that? Jesus came and put his spirit in you and you're here. You see, the temple is progressively getting an upgrade. Moses had a tabernacle. Solomon had a temple that was built. Jesus came and put the temple in your face all over the world. It's constantly getting an upgrade of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians says you're going from glory to glory. So Jesus lived and taught completely against this idea of separating sacred and secular. He had church everywhere he went. So let's take, for example, horses. Because I really want you to get this. Every time I visit my sister Emily, Emily, wave at me. 
Every time I visit my sister Emily's house, I see these horses. Now, to be honest with you, I don't want to ride them. They kind of scare me, okay? One went about 100 miles an hour when I was a child. I've talked to Dr. Phil about it, and it didn't help. But every time I see these creatures, me and Danielle make a comment to each other, like, man, these are magnificent creatures. Usually between me and Danielle or between me and Jesse or Emily, one of us say, man, these, it's clearly why God would choose these animals in the second coming, right? In the, in the second coming. It's, it's amazing. They're magnificent creatures. So you can just see the horses or you can see the horses. I hope you get this. Because you can just see the horses and you can just feed the horses or you can say, God made that. Look at that creature. You see the difference? Let's take, for example, cooking. I was cooking chicken tortilla soup yesterday for the fundraiser. They're the soups on the left. In fact, I'll place you a bet. If you buy my soup, you will be buying the best soup at the Super Bowl fundraiser today. I just wanted to make that a witness. I'm just glad the Patriots aren't in it. Can I get a witness, Vicky? Can I get a witness? I've had enough of Tom Brady. Can I get an amen? I'm just kidding. I love that guy. It's great. Okay. Woo, that went south fast. All right. <laughs> I'm cooking this, and I remember I'm cutting the cilantro. And you know, do you know when you cut cilantro how good it smells? Maybe you know what I'm talking about. I know some of you are like, man, Pastor Jordan, you need to go deeper. No, bro, this is deep. Listen. I'm cutting the cilantro. And I'm like, man, it smells so good. God, how did you make this? You know, I Googled cilantro. <laughs> you can find out a lot. You just Google some, right? So I Googled cilantro. Not only does it smell good, not only does it taste good, it increases the synapses in your brain. How do you know why I'm so smart? I eat it all the time. Last, totally joking. But it really does. It, it, it increases brain health. Why would God do that? Because he's just awesome. Because the whole earth is full of his glory, even cilantro. Some are like, well, I am too deep and spiritual for this sermon. Well, then you're too spiritual. You're missing it. God is in everything. He is in everything. He's in the smell and the taste and the health benefits of an 89-cent pack of cilantro. Amen? Amen? When you go on a date with your spouse, that dinner table is filled with the glory of God. When you teach your kids right from wrong and then hug them afterwards, that moment is filled with the glory of God. Bread. Everyday moments. When you take a little more time to make a meal at home with the kids and share it with your kids and you go around the table and talk about the day, that moment is filled with with the glory of God. Think about what Jesus did at the Last Supper. We're going to have the ushers come forward now, and we're going to receive this Last Supper together. We're going to take our time with this today. Usually I will say a couple of verses, quote from Romans, and talk about how Jesus washes us clean. But... Today, as the bread is being passed out, and you guys can begin passing it out, I'm going to read what happened at the Last Supper, because I want you to picture it. I want you to imagine that you are John, okay, that you are James, that you are Bartholomew, that you are Thomas, and you're sitting there, and Jesus is passing you a piece of bread. He takes this loaf of bread. And he breaks off a piece, and Pastor Ben, he shares it with you, and I want you to picture that. Jesus is having a meal with you, and he's had many meals with you before. You're the, di you're the disciples again. You've been following him. You've watched him do miracles. You've watched him show up to a party who ran out of wine, and he turned the water into wine. This is the Jesus that you watched a woman reach through the crowd, 
on her hands and knees, touch the bottom of his garment, and then declare that she was healed. This is that Jesus that you've been following. And I want to read to you now that moment. Before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of the world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them till the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper he laid aside his outer garments taking a towel he tied it around his waist he poured water into a basin I want you to picture this okay he poured water into a basin he began to wash the disciples feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him he came to Simon Peter who said to him Lord why do you Lord do you wash my feet And Jesus said, what I am going to do to you, you don't understand right now, but afterward, you will understand. And Peter said, you cannot wash my feet. You should never wash my feet. And Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. And Simon said, Lord, then don't wash just my feet, but my hands and my head. All of me, one translation says. Jesus said to him, the one who is bathed, does not need to wash except his feet, but is completely clean. But you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew the one who was about to betray him, which is why he said, not all of you are clean. When he finished washing their feet, he put on his outer garments, resumed his place at the table, and said, do you understand what I have done for you? Again, picture this, guys. Picture this. Jesus handed you bread. He's washed your feet. You're at the table with him. Do you understand what I've done? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Truly I say to you, the servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent me. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. The scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it even takes place, that when it does, you will believe that I am he. Surely I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. In other words, if you receive me, you receive the Father. That's what Jesus is saying. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. And he said, truly, I say to one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of what he said. And one of the disciples spoke up, asked Jesus, who are you talking about? So that the disciple leaned back, leaning back against Jesus said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus said, it is he who I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he has dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas. After he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into Judas. Jesus said to him, what are you going to do? Do it quickly. No one at the table knew why he said this. Some thought because Jesus, or I'm sorry, because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast or that he should somehow give it to the poor He immediately went out, and it was night. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am here with you. You will seek me just as I have said to the Jews. Now I say to you, where I'm going, you cannot come. But a new commandment I give to you. Love one another. Sounds like serve one another, doesn't it? Follow my example. Remember what he just said. Wash one another's feet. He said, love one another just as I have loved you. You are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Do you know how I know that you're a Christian? 
if you love people? Do you know how Jesus knows if you're truly his at the table? If you share the bread. If you love people. If you serve people. That's how I know. That's how people know. That's how God knows that you are his. So let's receive the bread together. Take that bread and hold it up. And I want you to go ahead and say, thank you, God, for the bread of life. Go ahead and thank him for being broken. God, I thank you for being broken in my place. Thank you for being willing to crawl on the cross for me. After you've thanked, go ahead and partake. Continue reading. Simon said, well, what do you mean? Where are you going? And Jesus said, where I'm going, you can't follow me now, but you will afterwards. They're going to pass out the juice. And Peter said, well, why can't I follow you now? I'm going to lay my life down for you. And Jesus said, will you really lay your life down for me? Truly, I tell you, the rooster will not crow until you have denied me three times. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't true, I would not have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And by the way, that place that he's prepared for you, it's often called the wedding supper of the Lamb. How many of you do love eating? Come on, you love a good meal. Why do you think that is? God put that there. It's the same reason I think girls love to be princesses. You know why? God made them a princess. I can tell you in one sentence why Disney is successful. God put in the heart of every woman a desire to be a princess, a daughter of the king. Let not your hearts be troubled. Prepare prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself. There you will be with me. Thomas said, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to me. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had seen me, you would have known the Father. From now on, you know the Father and have seen him. And Philip said, well, show us the Father. He was still missing it. And Jesus says, have I been with you so long that you still don't know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Hold that cup. Imagine you're sitting there holding that cup. And Jesus is saying, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The words that I say to you, I don't speak of my own authority, but the Father dwells in me and does his work through me. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else at least believe on the account of the works themselves. Truly I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Did you know that is in the context of communion? He said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. I'll ask the Father, and he will give you a helper, a counselor to be with you forever. The spirit of truth, the world cannot receive him because it does not see him or know him. But you know him. He dwells in you. He dwells with you and will be in you. And that's where we're at today in history. We're at the place where he's in us. So did you hear that last part? Because of the body, the bread being broken, and the juice, the blood, being poured out. Jesus' life is shared, and he is the bread of life, the one thing you've been looking for. Everything that you know is wrong in the world is due to sin, and Jesus came to pay for that by shedding his blood. So would you hold up that juice and say, thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood so I don't have to bleed, so I don't have to suffer. You took the punishment of my sins. Come on, make it personal, church. Tell them, you took the punishment of my sins. 
Wash me clean this morning. I receive your forgiveness. After you've thanked him, go ahead and partake. Because of the bread being broken, because Jesus was willing to be torn on your behalf, because he was willing to be pierced in the side where blood and water flowed out, that's why you can have communion with God. That's why we call it communion. Do you understand? And not along if you understand with if you are tracking with me. Amen? That's why. That's how. You have communion with God because Jesus, the bread of life. Now, you're probably thinking, why have I been sitting with this little jar this whole time? Grab that little jar. You see, I'm going to read a passage from 2 Corinthians, and that little jar, is there a spare one I could have right here? Some of you guys are going to think this is depressing, but this represents your life. It was bigger on Amazon, by the way. It was like. But I think it was, it's funny. It's God's way of putting things in perspective. We're going to read about the jar of clay that holds the glory of God. Because your life is like this little jar there's nothing special about it. And it can only be filled if you take the lid off and it's emptied. And I want you to hear this from 2 Corinthians 4. God has been rich in mercy and shown us a better way. The good news we preach was hidden behind a veil. And people are unable to see it. They're unable to see the glorious light, the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. Remember we just talked about that? Jesus is the likeness of the Father. But God has made this light shine in our hearts so we could know the glory of God seen in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, please don't miss this. This wraps up the whole sermon. Hear this. We have this light shining in our hearts. We ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure, the glory of God. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. Here's the thing. What's in this jar is your everyday life. You're going to work. You're coming home. You're making toast with your kids. You're going to the mailbox. You're working to provide for your family. The invitation to the friend who you don't know if they're saved yet, the invitation to the Super Bowl party, the everyday expressions of God's goodness, the everyday is in this jar. But in this jar is the glory of God. And what's amazing is so many people missed it. Jesus was standing right in front of them. And in every crowd, Paul, in every crowd, there was people who missed it. If there were six people, there was three. Got it. That they are now the temple. They are going to be filled with the glory of God. And then there's a couple people who it's not enough for them. They need you to take over, and they need signs, and they need miracles, and they need, they need. And Jesus is like, look, I'm the bread of life, and I'm standing right in front of you. And Jesus has filled your everyday life 
You just hold up that jar. He's filled it with the glory of God. Trevor, those horses are amazing. Right? Every part of your life. Tim, you watch people climb into a big, heavy metal object and then get into the air. That's a miracle that people can fly. So instead, tomorrow, of you going, I hate this bread from Aldi's, or whatever, you say, Lord, you are the bread of life. God is in this moment. God is in this moment. Can you stand up with me? Hold that jar up. And I just want you to thank him. Out loud, come on, guys, say, God, thank you for every moment that your glory fills the entire earth. (sighs) Lord, I remember when you told David who wanted to build a tabernacle for your glory to rest and and you facetiously told him, can I really be contained into a temple? And it's almost as if to humor him, you said, I'll let your son build it. And in that temple, though, God, we find the mystery. God, that your presence, guarded by angels, much like Eden, you give us access to your presence through the blood of Jesus. Would you just thank him for the blood of Jesus? Because it's because of Jesus that your little tiny life can have supernatural significance. Your tiny, just hold up that, hold up that jar. Just look at that jar. That's tiny. I'm glad I didn't see how small these were when I ordered these online because it's perfect for this sermon. It's your life. How many of you, come on, just be honest with me right now and say, you know what? Sometimes what I do, I feel insignificant. Come on, raise your hand. Raise your hand up, moms, if you ever feel like sometimes I just get tired and you feel like, oh. Right? Hold that jar up, though, and just think about that. God, just give it to him. God, I give you my life. As insignificant as it feels, fill it with your glory. Because the whole earth is full of your glory. Can we all just say that scripture together? The whole earth is full of your glory. One more time. The whole earth is full of your glory. Now make it a prayer. Help me to see it. Help me to see it. Every time I talk to a coworker, every time I talk to a neighbor, help me to see that your glory can fill that moment. Your glory can fill that meal. Your glory, God, it's everywhere we look. Where can we run and not run into you? Jesus, you're everywhere and your glory fills the earth. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Thank you for coming and worshiping today. Have a great week.